Okay, we're picking it up mm. in John chapter four, where Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman by the well of Jacob. And Jesus is slowly revealing himself in a very interesting way. He's not... He's not threatening. He's not dangerous. He's actually coming to her in kind of a humble way. And starting a conversation and she is amazed he's even talking to her. And, you know, he's, he's kind of opening up the conversation and saying, hey, you know, if you knew who it was that was talking to you and what he's got to give, well, you would have asked him. He's trying to pique her curiosity. He would have given you living water as well. Mm -hmm. Give me some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, okay, go call your husband. She says, well, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, well, that's right. Because you've had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. So, yes, that was true, what you just said. Now, last week, you'll recall that we kind of thought about this, five husbands. And did they all die? The possibility is maybe one or two, but not all five. And how does the marriage thing work? How did she get five husbands? And boy, what a mess. <laughs> and it, it occurred to me during the week that the one one reason you divorce a wife is for infidelity. And it could be that that is a, a recurring issue in her life. And really this idea of relationship, it's important to her, but it's, it's surely not working. And you got to admire how gentle Jesus is at this point. Because he could have jumped on her, made her feel terrible. But he's letting her know that he knows all about her. And he's not jumping on her. Now, we said there's truth. And here's mercy. Isn't it amazing to get the both? That he can be true with her and merciful. He, he doesn't want to destroy her. Yeah, it's interesting because he knows all this truth about her, but he doesn't use it to shame her even though it seems like it might be kind of a shameful situation. Well, sure. But he's not like wielding this knowledge. Yeah. And it's not about his knowledge so much as it is about his mercy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So showing mercy is a great thing. Mm -hmm. That's That's something that is like God. Mm. Now, you know that Jesus, he stands for everything that is right and true and good. But even as he is for what is right, he also is for people. And he wants, he wants to make people right.
He wants to save people. So, you know, when we evangelize, when we tell people about Jesus, we want to save people. We don't want to drive them away from God and make them feel like, well, God wouldn't want me because mm -hmm. I'm so messed up that, of course, he wouldn't want me. So with all this, just let, letting this woman know, I know all about you. Mm -hmm. She says to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> now, everybody knows what a prophet is, right? Prophet is somebody who speaks the word of God. Somebody who's connected to God. And you know, you, you can say you're connected with God, but Jesus is showing that he is connected to God because he knows about her. And she gets it. Okay, you're from God. And in a way, she's vulnerable. You know what vulnerable means? I looked that up the other day. Mm -hmm. Because we say Jesus was being kind of vulnerable. Yeah. Her. Look at that. Capable of being physically or emotionally wounded. Open to attack or damage. You know, you only open up to somebody you trust. Because if you don't trust this person, if you open up, they'll hurt you. Because they don't care. Have you ever opened up to somebody and then they really let you have it? I have done that a few times. And it's not very pleasant. And that's why you want to protect yourself. But Jesus started out, as Joni said, and he made himself vulnerable. He says, did you give me a drink? And he kind of took a little heat from her. How come you're talking to me, you Jew? Oh, well, how about some water? I'm thirsty. So, you know, she's feeling kind of vulnerable. And this is about God now. And so verse 20 is kind of funny, isn't it? Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. It's kind of funny, but... There's a us and them thing happening, or maybe a us versus them. And it's kind of a, I don't know, smoke screen or, or what is it? Is it a sidetrack? Sidetrack? Maybe it's getting a little close. I'm gonna look up the word sidetrack just for fun. Was this at Shechem? Yeah, we decided it was Sychar. To turn aside from a purpose, to deflect, to prevent action on by diversionary tactics. I don't know why she's necessarily talking about that. But then what, what she is talking about is worship. Worship. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she could be saying, sorry about that.
Where do you worship? Which place is right? What's the truth? Or maybe the better question is, is how do you get in touch with God? So we should worship the Lord wherever we are, don't we? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You bet. But she doesn't know that. Yeah. She's saying, well, we've been told we're supposed to worship here in Mount Gerizim. But you say that it's supposed to be Jerusalem. It's like, okay, what's the truth? How do you get in touch with God? What? Because in the beginning, she was quite proud of the the well being built by Jacob, wasn't she? The way she spoke about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you think she's really interested in the question or just changing the subject from personal to religious stuff? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, that's what I think. That's what some people, well, Joni is somebody. She's deflecting. <laughs> she she might be. Maybe she's thinking, oh, this is getting a little hot here. <laughs> because she, she is Samaritan. So she, um, she's a kind of second class citizen, the people are kind of perceived. And we are, because we are not Jew, pure Jew, so we are not supposed to worship in Jerusalem box. The... Um, oh. Yeah, generation to generation, we had to worship in particular place because we are not pure Jew. Well, I don't. Yeah, I mean that's a that's an issue. Yeah, but if you're a Samaritan. You're not going to run around saying, "Hey, we're half Jewish." See, they worship here at Mount Gerizim, where Moses said the blessing is going to be pronounced. But then the Jews say, no, 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 Jerusalem. Yeah. So here's a question. And do you know that Jesus kind of answers it and kind of doesn't? Jesus says to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Mm. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. So he's kind of saying your question is a non non issue, because it's not about the place. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, it's interesting how he brings clarity to this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he kind of gets around that by saying that's not the point. It's not a place. Now, up until this point, it has been a place. And he says, salvation is from the Jews. That means that Jerusalem is important. And boy, that is a most relevant statement today. Salvation is from the Jews. Mm -hmm. now there are lots of nations right now saying no that's not true salvation is from Saudi Arabia or any other religion but not from the Jews but here's Jesus saying this Salvation is from the Jews. That's because Jesus is Jewish. And he is salvation. Now, he's, he, he's not afraid to say, you know, you worship what you don't know. Mm. He tells her flat out, you don't know what you're doing. We 
worship what we know. And that, that also talks about the scriptures. That is, all the Hebrew scriptures are the word of God, not just the five books of Moses. The complete revelation. As far as the Old Testament. But he's saying, we worship what we know. But... Please. I am so sorry. An hour is coming. Now look, he said that just here. And now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So it's not the place. Spirit and truth, it's the inward person. That is, what, what good is it if you go through all the outward rituals but your heart is not in it. So is God satisfied with outward rituals? No. I don't think so. You're right. Because of this very thing. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, he's seeking... Isn't that interesting? Because the entire world has gone away from him. But he's not throwing the world away. He's seeking them. He's going after them to be his worshipers. Now, does, does God need that worship? This is what people have a hard time with. This is the famous question from, oh, an atheist whose name escapes me right now, but he says, you know, so if I don't say God is fabulous, he's going to send me to hell. Is that it? And that's not the point. If anything, that's the devil. But what God does is he seeks and he saves the lost. And these are the people that don't worship God. And because they don't worship God, they worship something else that isn't God. Something other than God. And you know, if you worship something other than God, you will become like that thing. So in Psalm 115, it's, it's talking about idols that have eyes but do not see, ears that do not hear feet, but they don't walk. And everybody who trusts in them will be like them. So there's a definite consequence of your worship. You know, if you worship something, some created thing, that's going to make you less than what God made you to be. Mm -hmm. Because we were made in God's image. Not 
after some created thing. We're, he is uncreated. And it's higher than us. If we worship something other than God, it will make us less. And that involves death. So it's not that God needs somebody to prop up his fragile ego. And if somebody doesn't tell me I'm doing good, well, then I'll just have a hissy fit and destroy everything. And that'll show them. That's not what God is about. You know, Jesus looked at the multitude and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And it's not about his own benefit. He gave his life and died in our place. Now, you know, when you receive Jesus to cleanse you of your sins, to make you right with God so that you have a relationship with him, it naturally results in worship. This is the end of the process. And it's only natural to love the one who saved you. And isn't it interesting that if you get stopped by a policeman for driving too fast and he writes you a ticket and then he decides, well, I'm not gonna give you a ticket. You're going to feel relieved, but you're not going to love that policeman. You just feel relieved. You got off of a ticket. Whoa, that's great. But when God saves your life, it would be truly odd if you did not love him. And again, think about this. He is father. Jesus always talks about him as the father. Mm -hmm. And the thing about the father is he loves. He has always loved the son. Even before he was creator or Lord or judge, he is father. And that means love. That means relationship. And that's why the Father seeks worshipers so that he can love them. So this thing about spirit is also interesting, isn't it? Not material. Not outward. How, how do you mean? Outward. That's just another way of saying not material. Ah, okay. Not or visible. Right. But you know, you got to be connected to God to worship Him. When you sin, you're dead in your spirit. You have no connection to God. So, When Jesus saves us, he gives us new life. He gives us the Holy Spirit so that we can be connected to God. In truth, you've got to know God in truth. If I lived with my wife and I called her Susie, I might get in trouble because her name is Joni. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I better get her name right. Yeah. I better know her. And God is such that you cannot just say God and get away with it. Okay, God, but who is God? And I don't think he appreciates being confused with other gods or wannabe gods. 
And so do you think do you think going along with that, that would mean truth would be knowing and believing what the Bible says, not not believing in other gods or or believing in in um adding words to the Bible or taking away words it says that some will do, some people will do. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. If he's revealed himself, there's no reason to make him after our own ideas. Yeah. <laughs> if it's there in black and white, right? Yeah. yeah. This is part of the part of, of sin and being fallen is not knowing God. Paul in Ephesians 4 talks about being in darkness, having a hardened heart, and giving oneself over to sensuality to practice things that are unclean because of the hardness of their heart. And again, that's just living in, in separation from God, living in death. But if you're going to be alive, then you're going to know the truth. What is reality about? Why are we here? And again, for the answers to these, you look at Jesus. Because he is the image of the invisible God. If you want to look and see what God is like, you look at Jesus. And if your God does not look like Jesus, then he's not God. And I might as well say that if a manifestation of the Holy Spirit doesn't look like Jesus, it's not the Holy Spirit. People do all kinds of of unbiblical names in the name of the Holy Spirit, and it, Jesus wouldn't do those things. And the Holy Spirit is not meant to be thought of as the irrational part of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is, if you look at Jesus, that's how the Holy Spirit acts. That's what the Father's like. You look at Jesus, he is the visible manifestation of God. So the woman says, I know that Messiah is coming, he who was called Christ. These are, this is a Hebrew, and this is Greek. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus says to her, I who speak to you am he. <laughs> now, isn't it funny that this lady can be so far gone, so messed up, and yet she knows Messiah is coming. And she's kind of poking him, saying, he's going to declare all things to us, kind of like what you're doing to me right now. And Jesus says, yeah, you're right. And that is an electric moment, don't you think? Of all the things in the world she could be doing, she's going to a well to get some water. And she's talking to this guy. And she can't believe she's actually talking to a Jew. And then it turns out this guy is all about God. And he says, I am the Messiah. What a moment. And at this moment, his disciples show up. <laughs> and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. So they're all shocked. 
Yet no one said, what do you seek or why do you speak with her? And I think this is funny because this question is directed at the woman. And this question is directed at Jesus. Now they wish they could ask these questions. Uh, they wish. They go, what's she on about? What is he doing talking to her? Mm -hmm. But they know enough to just mellow out for a second. I think this is what my family would refer to as a red banana. It was a code word in our family. Sometimes the kids want to know right now, what's going on? What are we doing? How come we're not doing what we thought we were going to be doing? And we would say, guys, red banana. And that was the code word for, we can't talk about it right now. We're not quite sure ourselves. You got to be quiet and not put up a fuss, as soon as we figure it out, we'll tell you. All that in red banana. <laughs> so instead of going through the entire explanation, we would look at them with the look. Guys, look at my face, red banana. Okay. And then they'd know, as soon as we figure it out, we'll explain it. Well, this is a perfect red banana situation. They would love to know what's going on. What are we doing? But they don't say anything. And the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the man, come see a man who told me all the things that I've done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. So the woman just takes off and she's excited. And I'm not the first guy to notice it, but she did go to the men. And who knows, but the women weren't really talking to her. Who knows? But she goes to the guys and says, this guy told me all the things that I've done. This is not the Christ, is it? Do you think those guys knew what she did? They probably knew. They're all in the city. But she says to him, come. Isn't that fabulous? You guys got to see this for yourself. Now, I think this is one of the coolest ways to evangelize. They're all kind of scared, don't know what to do about evangelism. Gee, I don't know about this. Why don't you invite somebody to church where the word of God gets taught? And then you let the word do its work. And the word of God always does its work. I'm reminded about a time when I was teaching the Bible in Zegan. And I was in Romans chapter 13, where it says that Everyone should re respect the authorities. And I taught through that part of Romans, and then a girl came up to me afterwards and says, I'm an anarchist. And I think the system is so corrupt, it needs to be torn down. And I don't even know what you replace it with, but we need to destroy the system. So she wants to stump me and she goes what about Hitler how do you respect the authorities there and I said well why don't you come back next week for part two and I'll tell you 
And then I said to God, oh my gosh, what do I tell her? <laughs> so I, I read up on Hitler and I read up on World War II and I found out about the confessing church. That is pastors that came out of the state church in Germany and they resisted Hitler. And they went to prison for their beliefs. But see, the point was they were willing to resist for the sake of the truth. And just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, maybe you can kill us, but we're still not going to bow down to your idol. And this, this girly was there the next week, and I taught about this. And she came up to me and said, you know what? I didn't sleep last Tuesday night, and I'm not going to sleep tonight. I already know that. And this girl took a walk one day in a forest and came back from that walk a Christian, believing in Jesus. And I thought, boy, if you ever wanted to minister to a anarchist, Romans 13 would be the wrong chapter. Don't teach on that, you fool. And there I was teaching on it, and God talked to her anyway. So the word of God always does its work. You can invite somebody to church, and you don't know if it's the right scripture for this person or not, but the word of God's going to do its work. Just invite them anyway. See what happens. She just says, come. You have to see this. And so they went out of the city. All right. Gee, you're pretty excited about it. All right. So that's pretty crazy. She got a lot of people to come out to Jesus. Now, back at the well, meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. That's why they went into the city. They bought food. He was thirsty and hungry. So they're saying, Rabbi, come on, let's eat. And he says to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? So... Isn't it kind of crazy that Jesus is blowing their minds right here? <laughs> Not the first time. You know, Jesus is in kind of a, oh boy, kind of attitude. Oh boy, this is going to be great. She's going to go in there and bring out the whole city. This is going to be really, really cool. And they're going, you got to eat. You got to eat. No, 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 no. No, we'll eat later. You're kidding. Oh, we got food. Why not? Oh, I've got food to eat that you don't know. Any Who fed him? You have any left over? Is it any good? He goes, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. My food. Wow. Now, can we just for next look up the word food and see what the dictionary says? Okay, look at that. That's kind of wordy. A material consisting essentially of protein, carbohydrate, and fat used in the body of an organism to sustain growth, repair, and vital processes and to furnish energy. Okay, like this is necessary to life. But you notice it's, it's about the body. Food is for the body. But Jesus says, I got food to eat you don't know about. 
To do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. That's not material. It's spiritual. This nourishes me. Satisfies. Huh? Satisfies. Satisfies. Oh, my goodness. And doesn't it give everlasting life as well, this food? Mm. Well... Doing God's will. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Yeah. Now, Jesus says doing what God wants, it's fabulous. I mean, don't you love eating when you're hungry? It fills and I think satisfies is the right one. Let's look up the word satisfy. Well, look at that, to make happy or to gratify to the full. The idea of filled up. Make happy. And yet you eat your meal and you go, ah, <laughs> let's have some coffee. That'll be a nice little way to finish things off. Well, Jesus says, this is what fills me. This is what satisfies. This is what makes me happy is doing what God wants. Do his will, accomplish his work. So Jesus is doing God's work. God says, I want this to get done. Jesus says, absolutely, I'm going to do that. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, Lift up your eyes and look in the fields that they're white for harvest. So this is kind of a, a, a saying. Four months and then comes the harvest. And I think it's kind of a, a statement. Kind of like Christmas is a long ways off. <laughs> Hmm. kind of like your birthday seems like it takes like a year or something for your birthday to come up it's a long time when you're a kid comes a lot faster when you're an adult but there's still time yet it's not time yet Something on that order. Now is not the time. But Jesus says, now is the time. Now. Look on the fields. They're white for harvest. Already, he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you've not labored. Others have labored and you've entered into their labor. So he says, the harvest is now. It's right now. And there's a sowing going on, and there's a reaping. Now, I haven't done a lot of reaping in my life. <laughs> I think I've done way more sowing. 
But that might be because I'm a sower. So I guess you can't really fault me for not being a reaper if I'm a sower. Mm -hmm. And I know that I can, I can talk to people and give out the word of God. People listen, and I never know what happens to them. I've talked to people like on buses or in stores, coffee shops, and I'll never see them again, and I don't even know what happened. But I don't know that I need to know. I used to think I was a failure. You know, you start right at the beginning, you lead them to Jesus, boom. Well, maybe it doesn't work that way. Somebody said one time that it takes five favorable brushes with a Christian before somebody starts to think about it for themselves. Did you get that? Five favorable brushes, which means an encounter that didn't turn you off. And then you start thinking, well, maybe there is something to this. Hmm. And by that time, maybe somebody who's really good at reaping can put it all together. And the guy goes, of course, how then can I be saved? So think about this. What if you're a number one person or you're a number three type person? What's the matter with that? Just keep doing your number three thing so that number six, who's the guy that just reaps them in like crazy, can do his job. There he is thinking he's fabulous. Boy, I'm just a reaper. I just reap like crazy. I don't understand all these people who don't reap. But he doesn't realize it takes five other guys to set it all up so that he can come in and look like most valuable player of the season. <laughs> and unless those five people are doing their jobs, he can't lead people to Jesus. So I quit worrying about which step I am or if I'm a reaper. I just give out the word of God. And I talk to people and I, I try to tell them about Jesus and try to be a favorable encounter with a Christian. But you know what? They're white for harvest. They're all ready to go. You know why? Because life doesn't work. Life is just like that lady. And she's gone through five husbands. And the guy she's living with now isn't her husband. And none of her relationships works. And she's trying to figure out what is the deal. Why is everything so kaput, broken? Why is my life going nowhere quickly? And then comes Jesus at the well, puts it all together, and she goes, wow, Messiah. I'm talking to the Messiah. So he's, he's telling his disciples something. Be open. Lift up your eyes. Take a look, you guys. Everywhere you go, there's somebody who doesn't know Jesus. Everywhere you go. I know that's true here in England. You know, I, I give out my card. It's got John 316 on the back. And I'll start a conversation and say, hey, by the way, you ever read this before? And they'll look at it. One in 20 people say, oh, yeah, I've read that. Everybody else goes, uh-uh, I've never read that. 21st century England. So you know you can start with John 3.16 and every shot is a winner because it's got it all right there. For God so loved the world. You lead off with love, that's a favorable encounter. And I tell people, hey, once in your life, you ought to hear that God loves you. 
and that he wants to give you eternal life. And you need to receive Jesus. I've given that card out to young people and they just say, wow, I've never read this. And I gave it to an older guy. I met in a coffee shop and he took the card and he says, I'm going to keep this card. He was on his way out. I don't know what he's going to do with it. But boy, is that talking to him? So the fields are white. They're out there. They're ready right now. Anybody you look at, they need Jesus. They're ready right now. So if you want to do something cool, put John 3.16 on a card and just say, hey, you ever read that before? If you find a better scripture, go for it. I don't think it matters. But at the very least, for once in their life, they've read scripture. And that word never comes back to God, not accomplishing what he sent it for. So every time they read it and they feel like, I'm a dope, wunderbar, they still read it. <laughs> so I win. All right. Just think, when you talk to somebody, they may be softened up for you. I got to say this. I went in to an outdoor shop in York, and I was looking for a collapsible cup. And I talked to the guy at the counter. Nobody in the store. I could do anything I wanted. And I gave him my card. And I don't remember the conversation, but he said something like, oh, I don't think he'd want me. And this guy was tattoos all over the place. I said, no, 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 no. He loves you. He wants you. He goes, yeah. I go, yeah. I go, do you want to receive him right now? He goes, really? I go, yeah. He goes, okay. What do I do? I said, I'll pray with you. You, re you repeat after me. I was so shocked. I will never do this. But I thought, I can't flinch now. Let's do it. So I just said, Lord, forgive me of all my sins. Come into my life. Thank you in Jesus' name. And it turns out that the guy he works with has been praying for him. And all I did was just walk into the situation and he, this guy was ready to go, knock me over with a feather. Somebody else had been talking to him. So you never know what's going to happen. All you're doing is entering into God's labor. The other people that have gone and you, God's working. That's the message here. God's working all the time. From that, from that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I've done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the savior of the world. We have heard for ourselves. So, you know, the father used this woman. And she was so excited, they believed her. Whatever she's got, you know, this is not a slight thing. So they say, let's go out and see whatever did this to her. And they're talking to Jesus and they're listening to him. They go, okay, now we get it. This is significant. Mm 
Mm. Now we know. Now we know. All they did was listen to Jesus. And see, that's what people need. They need to hear Jesus talking. They need to hear God talking. And, you know, at church, that's where you can hear the voice of God. When the word is being taught, it's not just, it's not just whoever's up there teaching. God is speaking in a way in church that he doesn't do when we're all by ourselves and scattered you know, doing our thing in the world. That's another reason why you got to go to church because it's fantastic. This is where God is really moving. He can say things that the pastor doesn't say. He can speak through the scriptures in a way that the pastor didn't think of. It's not all on the pastor. That's something I've come to know. It's just, this is an opportunity for God to work and he's going to do his thing and I'm going to get up and do my little thing, but that's not everything that's going on. So they experienced it. We can experience God. And church is a fabulous place to experience God. So I think we ought to just leave it here. Um, can I say that I have always liked church? I, don't, I really don't get why people don't come to church. But that's just me. And I don't want to, you know, put that on people, but if I wasn't teaching at church, I would be going to church somewhere. I just think, man, that's what I want to do. And if you don't have a church, I'm really sorry about that. You know, we've got our services live streaming on Sunday mornings. There's a lot of stuff up there on the web. But, you know, if you want to be with us, it's better than nothing. So you're always welcome. And we can pray that God raises up more churches. How about that? Mm -hmm. So anyway, I hope everybody is encouraged to just talk to people and see what God does. Because this is really exciting stuff. It is exciting. Yeah. Especially just to talk to somebody about Jesus. You never know what's going to happen. So what do you say we pray, huh? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you do seek the lost. Not because you want to hurt somebody or shame them, but because you love them. And we do pray that people would come to know how much you love them that you sent Jesus to die for them and rise from the dead. Thank you that there's hope. Thank you that there's forgiveness and cleansing and eternal life. Thank you that you're good. And we pray that through us, people would learn your goodness. Please work through us, and in us, by your Spirit. Make us people after your own heart. We thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.
Thank you.